Well, hello everybody and welcome back. Um, today we're going to talk about chapter seven, part one. Um, chapter seven, we're going to break into three parts, uh, which cover uh, all the different types of t-tests. So chapter seven covers three types of t-tests and we're gonna break them each into um, different weeks. So this week we're gonna talk about one sample t-test. Next week we'll talk about paired sample t-test and the following week we'll talk about independent samples t-test. And this is really when we start to move into inferential statistics and the idea that we are going to do some kind of experiment or research study on a sample and try to make an inference or say something about a population. And so this chapter um, or this lecture, we're gonna start learning the steps of a hypothesis test and you'll see that we use those same steps in every inferential statistic that we do from now on um, with t-tests, ANOVA, correlation, etc. So while maybe this first chapter has a lot of new information and the way we do things, you'll see that it's a pattern and we're going to use that same format um, throughout the rest of the class. So, starting with one sample t-test, a one sample t-test is used when you're comparing a treated sample mean to a population mean, which means you've got some kind of population, maybe it's um, college students, and then you take a sample from college students, uh, maybe you were trying to increased GPA and we're wondering if um, getting more sleep would increase decrease would increase GPA of college students. So we have our entire population of college students and let's say we know what the population mean GPA for college students is. Maybe um, there's some database that has all the GPAs for all the college students in the United States and um, the average GPA of college students is 2.8. We take a sample of college students, 50 of them, and we treat them by saying, you all must sleep for eight hours a night. And we watch and we're sure that they're all sleeping eight hours a night in the sample. And let's say we then ask for their uh, GPA and maybe their GPA after the treatment, which would be sleeping eight hours a night, is 3.0. And our question is, did our treatment work? Is there a difference between our treated sample and the rest of the population? In order to do one sample t-test, you must know or at least have an estimate of the population mean. So because we're comparing what our treated sample to a population, you have to know or at least have a good idea of the population mean, but you don't need to know anything about the population standard deviation. So for a t statistic, a one sample t mu, which is the population mean, has to be known or you have to have a reasonable guess. You have to have a reasonable hypothesis of what you think the population mean is. Sigma, which is population standard deviation, can be completely unknown. You don't need to know anything about that. So in order to do a hypothesis test um, for a one sample t, you need a sample that you do some kind of treatment to, and then a reasonable idea about what the population mean is. So that's what you're looking for. So the goal for any hypothesis test of, that we'll be um, doing throughout the semester is to evaluate the significance of the discrepancy between the sample mean and the population mean. So in this case, um, we have that sample mean GPA for students who all slept eight hours a night was 3.0 and the population mean we said was 2.8. So we're looking to see is that difference between the sample mean and the population mean due to our treatment. Because if you recall, whenever you take a sample from a population, so even if I don't treat the sample, and I just take a random group of 50 college students and ask for their GPA, their GPA will be slightly different 
than the population, G the GPA of the entire population. Every time I take a sample, the sample will be slightly different than the population, even without any treatment. And the difference, we talked about this a few weeks ago, the difference between our sample mean or our sample statistic and the population mean or the population parameter is called sampling error. And we know that that'll always be the case because we're using a sample to estimate the population and the two will never be exactly the same. And so the question is when we treat our sample and we have a different GPA like this GPA of 3.0, is that 3.0 just sampling error, meaning the treatment didn't work and this is just kind of random variation in GPA, or did the treatment work? Was the treatment effective? Is sleeping more um, leading to higher GPA? And therefore, um, that difference between the sample statistic and the population parameter is, is a treatment effect is statistically significant. And so that's the question we're trying to answer. So the hypothesis test is attempting to decide between two alternatives. Is it reasonable that the discrepancy between your sample mean, like that 3.0 GPA, and the population mean, which we said was 2.8, is just sampling error? And it's not the result of the treatment, that sleeping more doesn't help um, college students do better in terms of their GPA and this little bit of difference is just sampling error. Or is the difference between the sample mean and the population mean more than you would expect just by sampling error alone? So is the sample mean significantly different from the population mean, suggesting that we do have an effect of our treatment? So we're trying to decide which of these is the case. Is the difference between our sample mean and the population mean just sampling error, nothing to think about and that our treatment didn't work? Or is the difference between the sample mean and the population mean more than you would expect by sampling error and that we do have a treatment effect, that our treatment works? You'll see that SPSS computes a T for you, um, which is a ratio. And the larger the T, the greater the difference between the sample mean and the population mean, and the more likely that you have a treatment effect. The smaller the value for T, um, meaning that there's less of a difference between the sample mean and the population mean, we're more likely to think that that is simply due to sampling error. And a T is very, very much like a z-score. You can think of a T as an estimated z. Um, so the same idea, where a z-score of zero is, is the mean is no difference. Same with a T of zero. A T of zero would mean there's no effect. And as T gets larger in the positive direction or smaller in the negative direction, as it gets, as it gets more extreme, that increases the chance that we think we're seeing a real effect of our treatment. So moving from a Z score, which we did last week, to a T score, which we're going to talk about this week, um, a T, like I said, is an estimated Z because we don't know the population mean. Remember I said we don't need to know sigma? And in order to um, calculate a z-score, you could look at your notes from last week or pull up the PowerPoint. The formula was z is equal to um, sample mean minus population mean over standard error of the mean, and we calculated standard error using the population standard deviation, using sigma. But in this case, we don't have sigma. So we estimate it, and therefore our t is an estimated z. With our z-score, we know the nor that we have a normal curve, and we know a lot about the normal curve, as we talked about, that one, two, three rule. 
we know 68% of the cases fall between 1 and negative 1 standard deviations from the mean. Um, we know a lot about it. But when we're talking about a T, which is an estimate, we can't depend on the fact that we have a normal curve. We don't know that we have a normal curve. So we can't use a normal curve. Instead, we use what's called the family of T distributions. You probably remember the T distributions from your um, statistics lecture course where there was a T table or a T chart in the back of your book and you would have to look up what your critical value was. Luckily, we don't have to do that here in lab because SPSS does this all for you. But I want to give you an idea of why we use um, that, why you would have used that T table and what it is that SPSS is doing. But basically, there are what we call the family of T distributions. Um, they, they're symmetrical. They each have a mean of zero, just like when you use um, a z-score. Remember, z-score mean is always zero. Same with t, the mean is always zero. But the shape of the distribution depends on how many cases are in your sample. I'm going to bring this picture up here. So our normal distribution is this dotted line up at the top here. And there's our mean z-score of zero. But because we're estimating, sample size plays a big role. And you might imagine if you have a small sample, I'm going to talk to you about degrees of freedom in a second, but if degrees of freedom is small, it means you have a small sample. So this solid line is representing a very small sample size. You can see that the curve that we use, the T distribution that we use, is shorter than the normal distribution and wider at the ends, which suggests uh, more variability or more error, which makes sense because if you have a very small sample size, in this case the sample size when degrees of freedom is 5, your sample size is only 6 people. That's a very small sample. And what it's telling you is by using this distribution, um, there is a lot more error in your estimate. Um, in your, in your estimate that you're getting from the sample, right? If I'm trying to estimate all college students' GPAs from a sample size of six, that's a pretty small sample, and I'm probably going to have a lot of error in my sample. As the sample size increases, for instance, this middle um, distribution with the degrees of freedom of 20, that means we have a sample size of 21, which is bigger than six, um, you can see that it, the um, distribution starts to look more and more normal. Now this uh, gets higher, gets taller in terms of the um, height of the distribution, and it's a little bit less wide, suggesting that there's a little bit less error associated with this um, sample size of 21 compared to a sample size of six. And as your sample size increases, the T distribution looks more and more normal until if you tested the entire population, you would then get to the normal distribution. So this family of T distributions is all dependent on sample size. The smaller the sample size, the shorter the curve is and the wider it is, suggesting there's more error or more variability in your estimate, and the closer and close, and the, um, excuse me, larger and larger your sample size is, the closer uh, the T distribution looks to the normal distribution, suggesting that you're getting a better estimate. So the shape of the T distribution, I'm going backwards a slide, depends on the number of cases in the sample. When the sample size is small, remember we said the curve will be relatively flat suggesting a lot of variability and more error. As the sample size increases, the middle portion of the curve will become more peaked and it'll start to look more and more like a normal curve. And eventually, if you tested the entire population, 
you would know the mean of the population and the standard deviation. You wouldn't have to do any estimating, and it would be a normal curve. Which brings us to this concept of degrees of freedom, um, which we use for the t-statistic and we'll use for ANOVA and so on. It's a concept you see again and again in inferential statistics. Um, when you did t-tests in your lecture class, you would look up a critical value on a t-table um, and you use degrees of freedom to figure out where the critical value was. Again, in, in this class, we don't have to do that. You don't have to uh, use degrees of freedom um, because S or compute it even or uh, look something up in a table because SPSS will do it for you. But just to give you an idea of what degrees of freedom is telling you, it's saying that given the mean of a distribution of n scores, however many people there are in your sample, n minus 1 of the scores are free to vary. So degrees of freedom is telling you how many scores are free to vary. And everyone I'm sure is saying, what are you talking about? So as an example, um, here's a baseball example. If a baseball coach is setting the batting lineup and he has nine players, he only needs to make eight decisions. And again, degrees of freedom, n minus one. So nine players minus one is eight. That's our degrees of freedom. Why? And that is because once he's placed eight of the players, the last player, he doesn't really have a choice. The last player is a given. That person has to go there. He's the last person on the team. He has no choice. He will be placed in that last spot. So eight of the choices are free to vary, but one of them is not, which means if we have nine players, we have eight degrees of freedom, right? Um, because you can choose any of the players to be the first person in the lineup, any of the leftover players to be the second person, anybody to be the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. But once they've, he's decided who's the eighth player in the lineup, then there's no choice to be made for the ninth. It's just whoever happens to be the last one. So that is a general idea of degrees of freedom. So the formula for degrees of freedom is n minus 1. It's a great formula, probably the easiest formula in statistics. Sample size minus 1. Um, and it's used to describe how well the t-statistic represents a z-score, um, or how well the distribution approximates a normal distribution. So remember, uh, degrees of freedom is almost the exact same as sample size. It's just sample size minus one. So if you have a very small sample, like three people, n equals three, degrees of freedom is two, and that would be a very short and very wide curve, suggesting lots of variability. But as your sample size increases, degrees of freedom increases. Like if I had a sample size of 1,000, degrees of freedom would be 999. And that would be nearly a normal distribution, suggesting that we're getting a very good estimate of the population. All right, so let's go through an example of a one sample t-test using the steps that we are going to use um, as we do our hypothesis test. We'll go through one in this lecture, um, and then my SPSS lecture, you're going to see another example. And as I said, these are the exact same steps we'll be using for all of the inferential statistics we use for the end of, till the end of the class. So this is the first time you're hearing it. Bear with me. Um, if you need to, rewatch this PowerPoint um, and then go on to watch the SPSS one. And over a few weeks, hopefully this will become something that makes a lot of sense to you. So in this example, you're conducting an experiment to see if a given type of therapy works to reduce test anxiety in a sample of college students. A standard measure of test anxiety is known to produce a population mean of 20. A sample of 81 students was given the new therapy for six weeks. Um, use a two-tailed alpha level of 0.05. Okay, so let's look at this. 
We know the population mean is 20. It said that in the problem. We don't know the population standard deviation, which is fine. We have a sample, a treated sample, and the sample size is 81. And our question is, is this statistically significant at the 0.05 level? So we'll start by just identifying the population, the IV, the levels, the DV, and what test to use. So the population, who are we interested in saying something about? Well, that's college students. The independent variable, that's the variable we're manipulating, and that's therapy. The levels are no therapy in the population and therapy in our treatment group. And the dependent variable that we're measuring is test anxiety score. And we're doing a single sample t-test or a one sample t-test because we do know the population mean and we have a treated sample. So step one in our, hypo in our hypothesis test is to actually write our hypotheses in symbols. We have a, re a null hypothesis H sub O, null hypothesis, and H sub 1 being our research hypothesis. In terms of the null hypothesis, the null hypothesis is written mu equals 20. Remember, the null hypothesis is the hypothesis of no effect, that there will be no effect of our uh, therapy on test anxiety. So if there's no effect of um, therapy on test anxiety, well then the population mean should still be 20, right? Because it's not changing. So the average test anxiety in the sample of college students will be equal to 20 or will not be different than 20. That's the null hypothesis. It's actually not what you think is gonna happen. What you think is going to happen is your research hypothesis, H sub 1. And in that case, mu, you say, is not equal to 20. What we're saying is that our treatment will have an effect. We know that test anxiety in the population is 20. And so our treatment group will have a test, anxi a test anxiety as not 20. We, in this class, will always use the not equal sign because we're making what we call non-directional hypotheses. So I'm not saying that I think test anxiety will be less than 20, like it will go down. That's a possibility. Or test anxiety might be more than 20. Maybe the therapy is really bad and people are more anxious by the time they're done. All I'm saying in my research hypothesis, my non-directional research hypothesis, is that my treatment will have an effect and the population mean will not be 20. Please know that when you write your hypotheses in symbols, which are just those two um, lines with the, um, at the top here, this H sub O and H sub 1, that's all you have to do, um, you're always using a population symbol so mu as the population symbol for mean, even though you're testing a sample. And remember, you're testing a sample of 81 students to say something about the population of college students. You want to make an inference about what happens if every college student took this new, did this new therapy. My hypothesis isn't about the sample mean, so you don't want to use a sample symbol here like X bar, because you really don't have a hypothesis about the sample. You actually will know what the sample mean is, right? After you test those 81 students, you'll know what their test anxiety score is. But your hypothesis or your question is, well, what would happen if I gave this treatment to the entire population when I'm making this inference about the population? So your symbols that you're using here for your hypothesis are always population symbols. And in this, for a one sample t-test, it'll always look like this, H sub O with a colon, 
mu is equal to, and whatever the population mean is, you put it here. And h sub 1 colon with the mu is not equal to whatever the population mean is, you put it here. So this is always the format for a one sample t test. All right, step two, you're going to do a one sample t test in SPSS. I will show that to you in my lecture. And um, this is page 94 to 96 of your textbook. It's very simple to do. Um, so you're going to need to be able to run the test and then interpret the output. So here is our output. This is what you're going to get once you run your test. And it gives you a lot of information. We can go through it. It tells you N. That's your sample size. We tested 81 people. It tells you their mean anxiety score up here. 17.16 and will always round to two decimal places. It tells you the standard deviation, 7.22, and it tells you the standard error of the mean, 0.80, which remember standard deviation over the square root of n. So here's standard deviation over the square root of n. That'll get you standard error. So that's our descriptive statistics. And our one sample t-test up at the top where it says test value equals 20, this is the population mean. So we're comparing our sample to the population mean of 20. Here's the t that was computed, negative 3.538. Remember that t is an estimated z, so we're talking about like three standard deviations below the mean. Well three standard error, um, standard errors below the mean. It gives you your degrees of freedom, which is n minus 1. 81 minus 1 is 80. This is a big part. This is significance. This is telling you whether or not your uh, test is statistically significant. Do you have a treatment effect? This will be the same on all of the outputs for all of the tests that we look at. Your significance value has to be less than whatever the p-value or the alpha level was set in the problem. I will always tell you what that is. And I'm going to go back here to show you. In the problem, I said use a two-tailed alpha level of 0.05. Typically, it's 0.05. It might be 0.01. Those are really the only two choices here. So if I'm using an alpha level of 0.05, and I will tell you that in the problem, nothing you need to decide on your own, this significance value has to be less than 0.05 for it to be statistically significant. So 0.001 is less than 0.05. That means we have a statistically significant result, that our treatment was effective, that we think that um, test anxiety goes down after using this treatment, and we think that that would hold up if we gave this treatment to all college students in the population. Yes, it worked in our sample of 81 subjects, right? We see that their mean anxiety score went from 20 to 17. But what this significance is saying that we can make this inference and say that we are pretty confident that test anxiety in the population would go down if students all did this new treatment, this new therapy. And then the mean difference score here is just telling you compared to the test value compared to your sample mean. So 20 minus 17.16 gives you, um, sorry, they're doing the sample mean minus the population mean. So the sample mean is 17 minus the population mean gives you this negative 2.84. So what we're saying is that um, people uh, who took, the, who did the new therapy um, their test anxiety went down 2.84 points. So I know that's a lot of information. You may need to look at this again. Um, again, I'll talk about it in another problem coming up. 
um, but that is the output. The last step is to make a statistical and a substantive conclusion. You have two choices for your statistical conclusion. We, with our statistics, we are always testing the null hypothesis. That's the way that our statistics work. That's the logic of our statistics is that we're always testing the null. And remember, the null hypothesis is the hypothesis that our treatment had no effect. And so we have two choices. We can either reject the null. If you reject the null, think about this because this is sort of like brain yoga exercises. The null hypothesis says nothing is going on, that treatment is not effective. If you reject the null, what are you saying? You're saying that the treatment was effective. And you reject the null hypothesis because your p-value is less than the alpha level. So you would reject the null if this significance value of 0 0.001 is less than the alpha level that was set in the problem, which in this case was 0 0.05. So in this case, we are going to reject the null and we're going to say, hey, we think this therapy is effective. Um, this, and I told you that the 0.05 or 0.01 will always be provided to you in the problem. And if you reject the null, it means that your treatment worked or it was effective. Your other possibility is that you would accept the null. And that's because your obtained p-value was greater than the alpha level. So if instead of this saying significance of 0 0.001, it said 0.32. Well, 0.32 is greater than 0.05. And so if we accept the null, what we're saying is that null hypothesis that our treatment has no effect, I'm going to accept that. I think our treatment has no effect. So this means the treatment did not work. Any difference you see between your sample mean and the population mean is likely due to sampling error. So you only have two choices in your statistical conclusion. You're either going to reject the null if you have a very small p-value, or you're going to accept the null because you have a very large p-value. So in this case, I'm going to reject the null because our obtained p of 0 0.001 is less than the critical p of 0 0.05. And you're going to use the same format, but you're going to put in your own numbers. It'll say reject the null uh, because our p, whatever it comes out in your SPSS printout, is greater than the critical p. <coughs> Excuse me. Or you would have put you would put accept the null because our obtained p, let's say of 0.32, is greater than the critical p of 0.05. Those are the only two choices, and I would like you to just use the same format, the way it's written. So that's our statistical conclusion. This is how did we decide about our what did we decide about our treatment? How did we do that statistically? And we do that simply by looking at the p-value and comparing it to our critical p. Substantiatively is meaning say your result in words. This is where you describe what happened. And again, you will want to try to use this general format, but just filling in your own independent variable, dependent variable, etc. So students enrolled in the therapy program, that's our independent variable, had significantly lower test anxiety scores with a mean of 17.16, and you saw where that came from the printout. Their mean was 17.16, and I'm saying it's lower because I know the population was 20, right? So this is lower than 20. Here we go. Um, had significantly lower test anxiety scores, mean of 17.16, compared to students 
oh, who were not in the therapy program, I'm sorry, that says reading, that should say therapy program, with the, that mu was 20, right, the population mean is 20. And then in parentheses, this is how you write your statistical results. T with 80 degrees of freedom, which is a subscript, and in parentheses, equals negative 3.54, comma, P is equal to 0 .001. And you get all of that from your printout. All these numbers, you get the mean for the sample, the mean for the population, the degrees of freedom, the t-score, and the obtained p, all from your printout. So what you're trying to do is just be able to write, this is how we would write up our uh, statistical results um, in a journal article or in a presentation or in a paper. This is exactly how we do it. All right, so you made it through. Um, and we will go on to SPSS um, in the next lecture. Thank you.